Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and very welcome to the Swedish uh, segment of the global webinar organized by the ECGI and the GCGC. So thank you, first of all, to the organizers. Thank you also to the panelists who are participating today in this session. Uh, we have two hours. We're dividing it into two panels. And let me show you uh, what the schedule looks like. Um, here we go. Let's see if maybe that's. There we go. Okay, this is coming out of the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. We have two panels. The first one is the Swedish uh, policy response. We will talk about both uh, medicine and epidemiology, as well as business, economics, and politics. Uh, so we have a broad uh, mandate for this first panel. And then there will be a, a following second panel that will talk about corporate governance, what should companies do right now? What are they doing? Uh, what are their obligations? What's a good decision right now? if you're under pressure and uh, how do policies play out for companies? So I would like to start by introducing the panelists for the first panel. Johan Giseke is uh, Professor Emeritus of Medicine at the uh, uh, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm and has a long experience of epidemiology in practice, both at the Swedish Public Health Authority and the European Center for Disease uh, ECDC, let me just put it that way, and also as an advisor to uh, the World Health Organization, which apparently is in need of funding right now. Um, Anna Schimbay Bata is the former head of the Moderate Party of Sweden. For those of you who don't follow Swedish politics very closely, this is uh, a right wing party uh, in the Swe in Swedish parliament and was part of the government from 2006 to 2014. After retiring as the head of the party, uh, she has been an advisor and board member in a number of settings. And finally, we have Pat Crusell, who is a professor of economics at the Stockholm University, and he is a macroeconomist. And uh, I would especially like to point out that he's done interesting work on the connection between uh, climate and the macroeconomy and climate and pandemic are different things, obviously, but they're related in that they're important things that interact in complicated ways with the macroeconomy. Um, okay, so, so to set the stage, I know we have a lot of listeners um, who are following many things and maybe not Sweden most of all. Let me just give a few uh, data points. Here's the epidemic. Uh, there's a lag in reporting. So what this figure shows, this is a forecast by one of, one of my colleagues saying that uh, although reported deaths are very low for the last couple of days, uh, his forecast is that we're basically at the flat, more or less flat level once you take into account reporting delays. Um, in international comparisons, such as this one that I saw in the Financial Times, uh, this morning, uh, Sweden is uh, not so easy to see. It's right there uh, next to this big black arrow. It is a little bit higher than some of our neighboring countries and falling uh, slowly at this point, so no longer rising. And finally, uh, since we're going to talk a little bit about how Sweden maybe compares to other countries, I thought it might be fun to look at how the economy is doing and how people are, to what extent people are distancing themselves from others. The natural benchmark is the, uh, are the three <clears throat> other big Nordic countries. If you don't know the flags, uh, which I used to highlight the bars, then Sweden is on the left. This is Google mobility data. It's about a week, a little less than a week old. Retail and restaurant traffic is down by 40% that's about the same as in the other Nordic countries. Grocery shopping is down in Sweden. Workplace active mobility is down by about a quarter. <clears throat> Again, uh, pretty similar to the other Nordic countries and residential activities up according to this Google data. All right, that's what I wanted to use to set the stage uh, for our conversation. And then 
what happens next is I will let each of the panelists um, give some introductory remarks. And the idea is to start with Professor Giseke, then go uh, to Anasim Bhaibata, and finally to Pankusa. So, Yuan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bo. Uh, like you said, I've been involved in, in uh, infectious disease control for a long time. This is the fifth pandemic during my professional career. It started with AIDS, and now this is probably the last one. Um, I don't know how much I should go into the details about Sweden. You showed some interesting graphs already. Uh, but we have received, we've had a rather soft attitude in this country to the control of the pandemic, uh, doing more by asking people to behave than by writing ordinances and laws and policing. The effect is quite similar to other countries, though. If you go out on the central Stockholm at 9 o'clock on Saturday evening, you'll be quite alone because people are isolating themselves in their own homes. They do it because they understand why they should do it to protect themselves and to protect other people. Uh, like I say to most journalists who ask about the strange uh, strategy in Sweden, I say people are not stupid. If you tell them what's good for them, what's good for their friends and other people, they do what you say. So, uh, but the result is comparing to other countries that have a tougher lockdown situation, the difference isn't that great. I think that's a start where we can come back with questions. Great. Let me ask you one quick uh, follow-up. Um, so one policy measure that seems a little bit different uh, compared to neighboring countries is that the schools for younger kids and kindergartens were not closed. I no. understand that maybe Denmark and Norway are also trying to reopen but initially, uh, a lot of other countries closed all schools and all um, childcare. Yeah, and that has been closed all over. Finland actually had the lower grades, one, two, three, open all the time because the problem was they had this idea that people who had critical professions that were needed in society, that their children should go to school or to kindergarten. But there was a long discussion in Finland about who has a society critical profession, so they decided to let it drop for the younger children. And like you said, all the Nordic countries are opening their schools. Uh, one, I think, was Denmark did it yesterday, and two others are doing it on Monday next week. So Can you say some... something about the trade offs involved in opening and closing schools? Well, closing a big problem, especially for Sweden, where almost everyone is working outside the home. It would be different in a country with a lot of housewives or house husbands. Uh, there are one million children between ages zero and 10 in Sweden, and they need someone to look after them. If you close the kindergartens and you close the schools, uh, someone has to be home and take care of them, and you'd lose about 400,000 people in the workforce, many of them working in the healthcare sector. Uh, I have a friend who is, uh, a nurse head of an emergency department and she says she wakes up every morning praying that the government won't close down the schools because then she loses half her workforce immediately. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so then now I'm suddenly confused about whether Per or Anna should go next. In my different notes, I have different order. Maybe Per, are you ready? You mute. I can be ready. Um, so, so I have um, I have prepared slides, um, and hopefully that hopefully they work. Uh, so I and um, uh, I, I noted down like a maximum of ten minutes, and I hope it's less. Uh, so I'll take an entirely different perspective, economics perspective. I mean, I'm super interested in learning about epidemiology and so on, but it's not my area of expertise. Uh, so I'm just kind of a, an avid consumer. So let me comment on the, the issues here. So the one is from an economics perspective, macro perspective, is that this, we're looking at a recession and the question is a little bit how big it is. And I would say potentially it's a big one. Uh, and a guess, just guess, I would say, is that in flow terms, like per unit of time, it's we're losing 30% of output, maybe more. Um, 
And if you think about that, what it means for annual GDP, well, if it lasts for four months, it's like 30 divided by two, so it's 10% of annual GDP. And that's a pretty big drop. Um, and uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s had losses of a similar level or higher, actually. Though. Some countries had 30% for a number of years in a row. So, but in a flow sense, like we're losing a lot of output and the economy is not doing well. Uh, I add to that that, uh, like most recessions, they hit very unequally. So, so that you should really pay attention to the economically vulnerable here. And I'll maybe get back to that. But a very important point is that we don't really know the numbers. I threw out 30%. And my first kind of message or, or um, point to communicate is it's really kind of urgent to get these flow measures. And I think um, we, all are bit, we, we all have ideas. Uh, during the Great Recession, um, people also had impressions, but national income and product account statistics didn't really exist. And the Great, Re uh, Depression, was a, great Depression was a an impetus to start collecting data in a systematic way to see how bad is it, right? So I think we we need to have, be prepared to collect more like real-time data of how, just how badly we're doing and who's doing badly. And I think Statistics Sweden and National Institute of Economic Research should reallocate some of these resources, their resources right away to do, doing that. The second point that also uh, often comes up with uh, in, in the context of the corona is, uh, you know, we're getting into this potentially huge recession. Is it worth it? Um, because if you, you imagine the government didn't say anything or a government didn't lock down, you know, you can think of Sweden or other countries, economic activity wouldn't barely be affected. Uh, so we are, kind of, we are kind of generating this recession ourselves. Is it worth it? Is, the, is fighting COVID-19 worth it? And here, you know, there's obviously no right or wrong answer. Let me just say that governments, they perform these sort of unpleasant calculations by using things called quality adjusted life years. They, they have numbers because they need to decide how much to spend on road safety and all kinds of things relating to saving lives. Uh, the numbers different governments use differ. Sweden it actually uses a low number, like maybe even at most one million sec per life year. Okay, in the US, it's five times bigger than even the highest Swedish number. So here already, there's a range. Okay, and then you can you could do some simple benchmark calculations here. Say we save 10,000 lives. Maybe that's like more than we will say, but suppose it's 10,000 and each one will save 20 years each. You could do a calculation. You come up with uh, 200 to 1,000 billion sec. Uh, annual Swedish GDP is 5,000. So it's kind of, it, it's a lot of money in that sense. It's lives, but translated into money the way governments normally do it. So these are large numbers. It's worth fighting um, given standard assessments that governments do. So I think many people might say, oh, it's not worth it. But I would just say, no, based on standard assessments, it is worth it. Um, of course, if this, persists for really, really long, then the costs are mounting and, and maybe the, the balance turns the other way. So my, my first kind of summary of this is standard assessment, sure, it's worth it, let's do it, okay? Or let's continue doing it. A bit more of a subtle point is this recession, what it's like, because when you look at any recession, they're not all the same, and the recipe for economic policy is different. So the classical recession that people have in mind often is called Keynesian recession. And that's caused by uh, faulty demand. The investors and consumers just don't feel good about spending, maybe because they're worried that the economy is not going anywhere good. So they kind of pull back. But, and the point of that, and this is the point that Keynes made, and that's why it's called Keynesian. Uh, this can be self-fulfilling. If I think I'm not gonna sell anything, I don't invest and then, I don't know, my workers don't get any money, the, the people selling the goods or inputs don't get money, and then the self-fulfilling. What should the government do? Natural remedy, it's kind of use monetary and fiscal policy to stimulate demand back up. Investors and consumers are sort of wrong, so let's make them be more positive and, and uh, 
and the government can step in and help do that. Now, this recession is not at all like a, a, an ordinary recession. It's more to be compared to a war situation or a situation with natural disaster struck. Um, so demand should not be stimulated back up because now there are valid reasons to have low activity in the restaurant sector and, and all these places where social uh, uh, social uh, activity is high. So the, the third message is kind of forget classical demand policy. Instead, economic policy should make sure that when we open up, we can actually do it quickly so we don't get stuck in a, in a recession. And a one-liner on that is make sure businesses don't go under, help them now so that they don't go under, so that they can open up when it's time to open up. Uh, I think you one will have more maybe to say about when it's time to open up because that's an epidemiology type of question that I don't have the answer to. Second thing is we should also share the cost of output losses. This was something completely unexpected. You know, in a perfect world, we could have written insurance contracts and you know to cover against the possibility that COVID-19 would strike. Nobody expected this. So now I think everybody's aware that some suffer badly. Some actually do well. I think we should, as a society, stick together and help each other, okay? Some particular points about policy. Um, in a typical recession, you, you, policy market, makers might think, okay, it's okay that firms go under. Um, it's called cleansing. Uh, now, I don't think that that's a, a, a relevant thing to think about. Firms, get liquidity problems not because they're bad but because this lockdown was completely unexpected and if they're facing a lot of competition and competition is good they're not going to be sitting on a lot of money to start with so i don't know this is how, how we should view it how to finance it I, we shouldn't cut government expenditures elsewhere we should use debt debt um, i mean we can raise taxes on people who are doing well but we should primarily use debt that is a typical war finance we can kind of in a war, use debt finance. And then there's a bunch of non-standard things I think we have to think about. Make those charging fixed costs that firms face. For example, landlords. It's not that the, the value of uh, the building where the restaurant is renting has, has maintained its value. It's fallen too. So put pressure on landlords to help share. Um, uh, to avoid bankruptcy, we should look over and to avoid uh, cutting off employer-employee ties. We should um, we should think of ways to kind of delay these bankruptcy proceedings to allow firms to to stay in the game. Uh, another point I think hasn't been made so much is government. The government can I think it's it's helping many businesses now, and I think that's a good thing. It could consider adding a precondition for the help, which is to kick back in and start to re-employ when the time has come and the government says, now you guys re-employ. Because we are a bit in a, in a risk of, of coordination problem. So if the government can help coordinate our way back to full activity, that would be important. And to think about ways do, of doing this is important. So. Message four is to actually think a bit non-standard. We're in a new situation. Bernanke is like the example of someone who was able to think out of the box during the most difficult financial uh, situation since the Great Depression. And he had new ways to think about monetary policy that were then copied all over the, over the world. They worked. And so I think we have to be open to non-standard strategies. Uh, I have a last page on, on like research perspectives, but maybe I'm running out of time, Bo. What do you think? Um, yeah, we can get back to that if we have time at the end. Okay, so then I'll leave it here. Perfect. Okay, we will definitely follow up with the questions of this. And I noticed that there's a few from the audience, there should be a Q&A function as well, uh, where you can type in questions, and I will try to select from those, and then read to the panel. Um, but before we go to that, let me hand over to Anna Jimbe Motra and see if I can show her slides. Thank you, Boo. 
And uh, thank you both. I'm really happy that I'm number three in this panel because I could say something about both of these, especially from a sort of practitioner standpoint. I am a, a lowest level graduate of the uh, Stockholm School of Economics, but I'm invited as practitioner, I suppose. This would be my first health related crisis. Uh, however, I was um, in the Prime Minister's office during the 90s crisis of Sweden. I was head of the EU committee in the Swedish Parliament during the Lehman crisis. And then I spent three years, uh, very interesting ones, uh, as leader of the opposition to Mr. Stefan de Vian. I would res describe myself as more centre-right than right-wing. Uh, but I served during the migration crisis the year of Brexit, Trump, and also uh, during the years of terrorism, including in Stockholm. So in these types of crises, uh, that's really when, where you really learn about politics and how it works. I will go through a bit of the policy response to date. And for those of you who don't yet are familiar with it, who not yet are familiar with the Swedish system, I should also say that this is quite a low conflict and an almost sweet political culture if you compare to the US, of course, the UK, um, Israel, uh, Poland, Hungary and the like. We are very Nordic and even compared to the other Nordics, uh, we are maybe an outlier in trust. And I will show you a few examples of that. Johan Giesig also mentioned that. So thanks again and please show the next slide. Now, uh, first, let me try to sort of describe what this is about, uh, especially then for practitioners and politicians and any decision makers also in business. I would start by saying that this is bigger and wider than the 90s and the Lehman crisis, because uh, for number one, uh, it's also about health, lives, and also the real economy. I would say the 90s crisis uh, and especially the Lehman crisis were more in the financial system, which is of course very important to the entire economy yet still they were concentrated to banks and financial systems uh, to a greater degree than this is. This also, and that's point number two, happens in a more globalized world than ever, politically and economically, uh, which also makes a small open economy that goes very vulnerable. And it's the first case ever, uh, at least in modern times, that we try entering a crisis. We knew that crises will come, and now it did globally after a decade of quantitative easing, which has changed the possibilities of monetary, the, um, yeah, the possibilities really of monetary policy, policy to have effect as it used to. And number three, uh, the political side of this, as you can see, not least in the US, also around Europe, is that this happens in a time of less stable political world order. The Lehman crisis was really managed quite well in the helms of G20, EU, US, IMF and so on, which also enjoyed high levels of trust and they function basically as they should, which is unfortunately not the case today. And you can see that on the international stage and also nationally in all of our countries, I think, more or less. Uh, we also, of course, live in the age of digital and immediate and emotion driven social media which amplifies conflict and polarization. That was sort of where we were when we got into this. Now, I think most governments are doing their best, but we'll see where that takes us. And Swede, uh, those of you looking to Sweden from the outside should also know that we are small and open, which is important to understand the economy parts of it. We are also quite good at managing central industries, but less good as in um, uh, making it easy to run SMEs in the service sector. That's expensive and quite difficult here compared to many other, many other countries, uh, even in the rich world. We also uh, are outliers in high levels of public trust. If you look at the World Values Survey, for example, you will find that we are uh, one of the most secular countries in the world. We use, usually compete with Japan. We have quite strong individuals, quite strongly supported individuals, whereas we at the same time trust government and public government quite highly, uh, which is very important to understand if you try to understand what we do. Next slide, please. So uh, just to give you a choice and a quick picture of what we've been doing, yesterday the finance minister presented 
uh, yesterday, April 15th, the measures to date and some new ones. Uh, we do have a ban on big crowds, not as hard as in many other countries. We do isolate the elderly. We close some schools, but not as many as many other countries did. And we expanded, of course, on, on healthcare to take care of the immediate effects. Now, yesterday, the finance minister presented the last special budget bill, and we are now uh, adding up to approximately 4% of GDP in fiscal stimulus, and whereof half of it would be discretionary measures and half of it would be uh, automatic st stabilizers. Uh, and these are really about both enabling the, the financial system, the individuals and businesses to live through this. Um, yeah, let's run to the next one. Now, the left part of this picture is from The Economist, April 4th. Why Swedes are not yet locked down? It was easy for anyone to spot Swedes on cafes enjoying some spring sun. As you know, we have long and boring winters, so we rush outside when the sun finally comes, and so we did this time. I suppose we behaved a bit better during the Easter holidays last week and stayed at home and didn't go skiing or outdoors or to restaurants and so on. But the Swedish policy response to date uh, trusts and our system, meaning not as hard political measures as many other countries, uh, allowing the people to trust the system and trusting people to uh, behave. And the jury's really out about how this works. We are really, as you both pointed out in your slides before me, we still really don't have the numbers or the results. We do have some figures on the right hand side of this picture. We do know that Sweden doesn't uh, employ emergency legislation. That is really not really allowed in peacetime. Uh, it is in uh, explicit wartime. And there are now some measures being allowed and decided upon. Um, to be increased, but government can act and has chosen, but, but cannot employ emergency legislation like in some countries. We do less of fiscal stimulus to both, to, especially to business. If you compare us to say, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, for example, there are uh, European countries, also countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, who are definitely higher than us in fiscal stimulus. And if you compare the number of cases with the population, which is in our case quite tiny, you can find, if you look at the number of deaths for every million in population that we are unfortunately to date, quite a bit above the Nordic colleagues who are employing higher restrictions and also have seen a lower number of deaths. Now we don't know yet where this will take us all in a year or so. Um, but this is where we are. The worst case, I wouldn't say the worst, but to date the worst case presented by government is a GDP fall of approximately 10% and record high unemployment, especially of course in service sectors where everything just stopped. Uh, I, did, I think I have one last picture. Yes, uh, you asked us, at least me, for possible scenarios and this sort of bridges of course over to the discussion. Uh, Swedes are both high conf highly confident and very low in a very peculiar sense. On the one hand, we know that our wealth was built upon our industries, multinationals, uh, which enabled us to build social systems and all of this because of also a competitive advantage after making a better, getting a better outcome after World War II. We also believe, we also trust our systems. So if we manage to get well out of this, we will be immensely even, even more proud than ever when we tour the world as tourists and we'll be rich and prosperous and happy about it. That's the super positive scenario, unrealistic to that end. To the other extreme end, I would point at the risk for worse health effects. We are higher now in how deadly this disease is. It kills people. Uh, a long time flattening of the curve uh, could be more dangerous to the economy because as time 
uh, passes, the risk of, for, for example, bankruptcies increase. And that will, would do something to trust. Uh, that could be very dangerous. Now, around Europe and also the US, you've seen the last few years that trust in politicians and traditional parties had, had deteriorated. It's now really shooting up where politics are becoming serious again. Um, but if the outcome is worse than expected, there will be a huge and quite dirty, I think, blame game debate, uh, badly damaging government and, and several others, I suppose, in the general elections due uh, already in 22. Uh, why not stop there? Uh, making the point that, of course, the extreme negative scenario is also unrealistic. Uh, I suppose the truth will lie somewhere in between. And I do hope for the best. <laughs> okay, I'm not muted. Thank you very much. Thank you all three for the introductory remarks. Um, I have a, a number of questions. I would like to start. Uh, uh, you want to uh, take all this discussion of economic policy and ask you, how does that figure into the decision making and the advice that the public health authorities give to the government in Sweden or in other countries? How is it ignored? Uh, how does it play into the medical advice? Um, I would say it's largely ignored and I think it should be ignored. Uh, we've had some discussions where we say that the public health experts shall not be uh, advising too much on economy. We should say that this is, these are the alternatives and you, the government, you price them and see what we can stand economically. There's been a little sleep there. I think that the public health side has been a bit too strong here and government has followed suit. That's changing now, but it's been at the start of this epidemic, the government has listened very closely to the public health agency. Can I say something about the deaths since Anna brought them up? Uh, two things. One is that the countries that are opening up slowly now will have their deaths that Sweden already had. Uh, when the virus starts spreading a bit more than it has now, the people that if they were, had been Swedes, they would be die dead now, but they will die in the future. That's one. The other is that statistics and public statistics is a very difficult area. And we were wondering, there were, I was actually a radio journalist who found out, why does Belgium has twice as many deaths as the Netherlands? which they, is what they, they publish. Well, that's because the uh, Belgium counts cases from old people's homes, institutions where old people live, whereas Netherlands does not. Uh, Italy only counts cases that come into hospital and die, not the ones that die outside the hospital. Uh, there are problems with the US figures as well. So statistics is a difficult area. Uh, did that answer your question? Or did I talk about the wrong things? This is excellent. Yeah, it happens in economics too, actually, that we have a hard time with statistics. So all the economists and finance people will recognize the issues. Um, okay, so I think we have a couple of questions about uh, how peculiar this, uh, notably, I guess, two themes have been brought up. One is um, the trust, the welfare state, is it easier? Uh, to implement certain policies in Sweden, can you use a softer touch because people do what they're told, basically. I think I'm not dumbing it down too much. Um, and the other one, I guess, is uh, the welfare state. So maybe it's less costly in a country like Sweden to ask people to stay at home than it might be in a, an economy where people have weaker safety nets. So I, I guess at the end of the day, this all boils down to the question of how, what translates here? Is there anything useful, any good or bad lessons from Sweden for other countries? I don't know if you have thoughts about this in that panel. Um, I, I, Sorry, yes. I certainly agree that it makes it easier in a uh, welfare state to um, have a softer transition to providing the kind of support a significant problem in the U.S. that has gotten no publicity is that in the United States, people who make less than 
about $20,000 a year don't file tax returns. And so the government, unlike a state that has medical health records and things like that, we don't have any, any way to get money to the really poor people. Uh, we are sending checks to people who file tax returns, but these people don't file tax returns. And there are a lot of um, people who, uh, in other words, so because of the, the safety net in a country like Sweden, uh, when the government decides to kind of galvanize into action, it's unable to do as much. Uh, sorry. So it's unable to do nearly as much as these other countries. And I think this is a very significant problem for the United States, this lack of, of records for the kind of bottom 25%. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Yeah. All right. Um, Anna, did you want to talk about this topic? In the chat, there was a question about the Swedish constitutional possibilities of emergency measures. I would like to answer that and the statistics. And then about this. Uh, as to emergency measures, I mean, the government can act, the parliament can act, uh, parliament can act quite quickly and has, for example, changed the, the possibility to close schools, which was previously not possible really for this reason. However, outright emergency constitutional capabilities for big time lockdown of the entire country, those are by our constitution allowed only at war. Uh, so now some more peacetime emergency measures for say saving lives and for health reasons are being introduced, but the big time French style declaring a war on this is not applicable in Sweden. So it's really done case by case. Yes, I agree with uh, Johan Giesecke that we, uh, we trust, we put our trust in public health authorities and do so a lot. Uh, Non-Swedes would find it quite peculiar, I think, to see most of us watching a daily televised press conference from the public health authority every day at two Swedish time. Uh, and people actually do at this point. Now that's one uh, perfect set of information from medical experts and then politicians of course have to make the call and take decisions and they do. We do however, speaking of the last question, have quite wide automatic stabilizer safety nets our bottom 20-25% are really um, not outside the formal economy. They all pay tax, they are all registered and so on, which is quite extreme, I think, if you compare, of course, to poorer countries. And as I understand the question correctly, also, if you compare to the US. Uh, so it's actually quite easy to take the bottom 20% and enable them to survive easier. Also, mm -hmm. I would stress that the... Um, unemployment benefit system, which is to a very high extent state subsidized and, and paid for it, tax paid for, uh, was just hired now to enable individuals to, um, uh, well, not having to move if you lose your job, for example. Also wages, short time wages when workers are uh, temporary layoffs are quite generously subsidized here. Uh, which makes it for the individual case quite easy to survive and it also for the legislators and tax authorities for example quite easy to uh, ease the burden for the individual and keep count of them also. Everyone is in the formal system in Sweden and we are sort of quite proudly so. Great okay um, I, here's something I'm curious about uh, what does exit look like? And I would like to hear all the panelists talk about this, or I mean, we're not going back to normal, but we're going to back, go back to more normal. Uh, maybe you want, can you say something about how, how do we get out of this medically? Are we waiting for the vaccine? Are we waiting for this herd immunity that people talk about? Or are we, are we waiting for treatment options? Or how do we? How, we, how do we get out of this? Yeah. Oh. I must say I've been, laughing and not laughing but <laughs> inwardly when i see the other countries in europe uh, putting up all these restrictions and i've been asking myself how are they going to climb down from this mm -hmm. has anyone thought about the exit strategy before they introduced the rather strict measures and i think very few politicians across this continent have done that 
uh, my first, I remember the first one I asked was, I asked Norway, um, when are you going to open your schools again? What would be the criterion to do that? And I'm not sure they even know now that they're doing it. Uh, but I think what will happen though, is that you need to take one restriction at a time. And I think that's the way it will be in, in a month or so from now. You start by scrapping one restriction and then you wait for one, two weeks to see what happens with the spread of the virus. If it's okay, if it doesn't increase, then you take another restriction and you get rid of that one. Just like is happening now in many, Austria is opening small shops to people. Uh, the schools in our Nordic countries are opening again. So gradually everyone is approaching the Swedish model. Uh, and I think um, that's the way we will get out of this. But uh, waiting for the vaccine is, is unreal. And are we going to keep the old people locked up until the vaccine comes around another one or two years from now? Not locked up, but, but self-isolating in their homes. That won't be possible. It won't be possible in a democracy to keep the measures we have right now very long. You could do it in China. You can't do it in Europe. However. I would say two things on T. I would say testing and trust. Uh, it would be beneficial. You one would know when this is possible. I'm not a medical expert, but it would be beneficial for society and trust if we can all get tested as quickly, as cheaply as possible, because now you sort of fear to go out in case you just happen to expose someone for a deadly virus. People are starting to lose friends and family members and you don't want to uh, take that risk if you can avoid it. So that would enable people to go out and, and do business as usual. Have, this, there won't be in a, an old, old normal and business as usual, but starting doing business again would be safer and more trusted if tests are widely available. And then trust again. If you look both nationally, nationally and on the European level, there are more uh, barriers set up now than, than in modern times at all after World War II. Europe was built on increasing openness and then in a few weeks we shut it down we shut international value chains down, we shut borders down, we impose controls everywhere, and it will take time and it, and it will need trust to reopen that. And you will sort of have to prove that this works step by step. And there are, I want to warn a bit for the political risks of backlash effects here. When you gradually reopen and you get a, well, health and case backlash and people die from it, then um, all your measures will, of course, be questioned for any political leader in, in any country. It will be tricky and take time and trust. Yeah, Per. I can say something also, Bull, uh, on this. I mean, I, I think the question of an exit strategy is a little bit like the elephant in the room. I mean, you, you one pointed to it, like what are these countries thinking about the future? Um, but let me take the economic perspective on that is that I think one very common reason why we get these sort of bad unnecessary recessions is when people are just worried about what's going to happen. Will firms make an effort in investing, explore new markets and so on? If everything is so uncertain, no, they will wait. Similarly, consumers are worried about their income. They won't buy durable goods. So it's super important to be as clear as possible on what the strategy is going down the road. And I understand that the main, main determinant is of course how this is going, the epidemiology um, of the whole thing works out. And I understand also we don't know because we don't know everything about this particular virus. Uh, so we keep learning. So for that reason, it's, it's super important. But, I don't think we can eliminate that uncertainty, but what, what we can ask our governments to do is to be more clear on how they think, including the health authorities. Like, how are they thinking? If they, if they, do, are they think, because I mean, I think for example, many economists I talk to, they seem to say, oh, we have to shut down now very hard. But then when you talk to them, they are relying on the hope that pretty soon we'll have if not a cure, but something that will make the effects of the virus much less severe so that people will not die. So then, okay, I have no idea. I'm not a virus specialist, but that's resting on a belief. I think we have to 
require of our governments and our health authorities to really try to extend themselves in, in explaining how they're thinking, because the more they do, the easier it will it be for the economy to recover. If we, if we keep this like in a haze, we are setting ourselves up for, for a much bigger recession than we need. So I understand it's extremely hard to answer the question because they, they are fundamentally about things we don't know yet, but we should still talk about them. So look, we don't know the range of this, the range of that. We think maybe this, maybe that, but this is how we're thinking. That's what I think the governments and the health authorities should be forced to deliver to us. Uh, I understand it's always difficult to say stuff when you don't really know, um, but it's very, very important to eliminate any uncertainty that is unnecessary. So we, I guess you want proposed a, a partial answer to that question saying we will uh, open up a little bit at a time and then see what happens. That's not exactly a prediction, but at least it's kind of a cookbook. But, um, Anna did mention the tests and it seems like a lot of hope has been put to tests. Not the um, test that says you have the disease or not, but the test that says you have antibodies, which means you have had the disease and perhaps that you are immune to it and non-contagious to others. It does, is this just the hope of lay people, Johan, or is this, is this something that is real? The, um, the antibody I'm, tests. I'm gonna, no, no, it, it's happening as we speak. And it will answer a lot of questions. If we get a proper, we already have the test to say that people have had the disease, they will now. Most of them won't even know that they had it. Uh, the, the tests are being employed as we speak in uh, across the population and also for special groups as uh, healthcare workers and so on to find out if they're immune to this disease. And it may be there are indications that this figure, people who have had it, is far, far higher than any of us has even guessed so far. But anyway, like you say, and that will answer our questions, how, you, how common is it to have the disease uh, without being aware of it, that it was so mild that you didn't even notice? How common is that? Uh, we have this, how long are you immune for? Because it won't be lifelong, that we know. Yeah. Um, but it will really answer a lot of very important questions in a few weeks' time. If it's not lifelong, is it, what are the possibilities medically? Do you have some sense? Probably about a year. Mm. Okay. In that, or in that size. Great, okay, I know Jonathan Macy had one more question. Uh, Jonathan, are you there? I am, I am there, uh, Bo, thank you. Um, it's question is more really in a way of a comment, which is, this is a very striking conversation from a US perspective in that it indicates to me that Europe is really very far ahead of the US on this question of how will we get out of this crisis for two reasons or three. One is um, we don't know, everyone is assuming very interestingly among the panelists that the government and the health authorities will control the exit. Uh, that's far from clear in the US. It could be that we descend into a form of sort of epidemiological or public health anarchy and businesses start to open, churches, uh, et cetera, start to open. I think this is much more likely in the US. The second is, as it had been very big in the news in the last few days here, there's open um, uh, controversy between the president of the United States, Donald Trump, and governors, particularly uh, Cuomo in, in New York and the California governor, about who, which, governmental entity has the authority uh, to open things up. So um, I would just say we're really a mess and I envy this notion that things are uh, much more organized and there's a much clearer um, organizational structure with respect to dealing with this question. So thank you. On behalf of all Europeans, thank you very much, Jonathan. But let me, let me uh, challenge that a little bit. 
and turn this to Anna because you just talked about what's happening to European cooperation. And you could imagine that the Nordic countries, you know, in perfect wisdom, kind of open up at the right, uh, you know, considered time. Uh, but then the rest of Europe is in lockdown and nobody's buying our stuff and then the economy doesn't really restart. Uh, so what, Anna, can you say something about how does this coordination happen at the European level? Does it happen at all? What can we hope for? Now, thank you, Bo. That's a good question. Uh, no one knows. This has never happened before in this scale, uh, not as quickly, not as internationally before. Uh, more, well, border controls and controls and restrictions are imposed than ever before since the EU was founded. And on top of that, we have the multi-annual uh, multi budget negotiations just about to take off, where we thought that Brexit would be a huge problem. It seems sort of minor now compared to this. Uh, we have a new commission and a new legislature, meaning we don't really know where we have them yet, apart from that they are studying and trying to get a grip of things. And we have countries like, say, Italy and Greece. And we also still have, uh, what, around 70 million people um, on the run in the world meaning the migration crisis is still there and Brexit is still there. So Europe has a lot of on its plate. Uh, now the Eurozone ministers and the finance minister have, have had several discussions about this. You see the Eurobond uh, discussion as sort of on the surface of this, which is really a symptom of where you have it now. Uh, I do believe in coordinated response where you can get it, such as expansion of European Investment Bank loan facilities to SMEs. Uh, that's just fine, of course, if, if possible. However, uh, Swedes, Germans, Nordics, Dutch are still skeptical, to say the least, to bailing out countries like, say, Italy, who already before Corona had a national debt of 140% almost. We have just under 40 here. Uh, so you still have this uh, built-in problem in Europe with, again, a lack of trust. And trust now will need to have to be rebuilt from a very, very low level with lots of common huge problems on, uh, to deal with. I don't think there will be Eurobonds because we won't have the mutual trust or will to set up uh, mutual uh, guarantees really so um europe will try its best europe just also proved and showed that we don't have coordinated health systems we believe in that to be done uh, nationally or even locally uh, but the corona pushed ahead joint um, procurement efforts uh, sourcing from say china or other countries so we need we know we need all the coordination we can get uh, but we only get the coordination possible between scary nation states with increased nationalism, unfortunately, who don't really trust their neighbors as they used to. A very, very tricky environment indeed to navigate in. So you mentioned uh, public debt, which is a source of friction across the European Union. Sweden used to have high debt, and there was a big... Uh, crisis in the early 90s and the big one of the biggest takeaways was the new political consensus around uh, moderate public debt and fiscal responsibility in the central government. I think every crisis tends to have one or two lessons like that where uh, a lot of people sort of move their opinions. Um, I think in 2008-9 the global financial crisis uh, the biggest takeaways were around the need to regulate the banking system. Maybe it's too soon, but I wonder if the panelists would care to say something on what, what do you think are the lessons? What have we learned so far uh, that we can do better next time something like this happens? Well, let me maybe start. Um, I think the first point is that we, we we really don't have the full record yet. So I, I think we, we, we have to be really careful about drawing conclusions on what has been good or bad policy. Um, uh, the, sec the second point is, 
as I also said before, I mean, the, the death thing, I mean, now we can be very happy that we've had a totally under control death situation in Sweden for, uh, you know, for a long time. And we can feel quite secure now in, in uh, government spending quite a bit to keep, keep the businesses alive and keep the employees tied to, to their workplaces and, and all of that. So I, you know, I think that's something we can say already. I'm super happy that this is true. And I understand it's not at all going to be so easy in Greece, etc., cetera, uh, Italy. And, and uh, so I think that's a, a mini lesson that we, we did well by getting things under control. And now we can enjoy the fruit. Definitely. That's, could I continue there? That's a perfect sort of bridge to me. We don't know each other very well. It sounds like we're sort of coordinating. Definitely, we got the fiscal policy framework after the 90s crisis. In again, uh, another thing we learned there, wide political consensus on what is really important. When the sense of urgency sort of hits and crisis hits, quarreling about stupid little things goes away and serious politicians across aisles focus on what's really, really important. And the Lehman crisis taught us about the importance of a stable financial system. So uh, both of them are very useful now, uh, but after any crisis, you sort of learn all the lessons from the just recent crisis and you learn never to get into that exact crisis ever again. Uh, and I hope we never will. However, uh, what we really need to learn now, which is a bit early yet, is what we learn from this particular one. We should keep, of course, the stable fiscal policy framework. We need to keep stable financial markets and systems. And we are just also learning uh, what happens to global and globally interdependent uh, complex value chains in goods and services when that those links are breached. That just happened immediately in the entire world at the same time. That is what we really need to learn from and draw the right lessons from uh, for the future. We, I hope also we also learned uh, that after the last few years, the, the angry strong man with the giant ego uh, doesn't have all the political answers uh, when crisis really hits. I hope we can see the return of uh, boring, low-key, but serious figures like Dr. Merkel of Germany, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven in Sweden, uh, I hope, also, and others who are sort of just, or Anna Solberg in Norway, who are just getting on with the job and getting the job done and not thinking about their image and ego and tweets all the time, but really taking things seriously. Uh, if that is a political lesson from this crisis, uh, that will be very useful for anything we'll meet in the future. Great. Yuan, what do you think about drawing conclusions and learning lessons at this stage? I don't think we learn. <laughs> we never have before. No, I'm serious. I think 30, 30 years from now, this will be completely forgotten on the medical side, on the public health side, on the economical side. No one will even remember. I don't think Something um, happened, I think, maybe we lost that. We have already forgotten him. <laughs> <laughs> he was warning us. <laughs> Are you back, Johan? Hang on. Yes, I'm yeah. back now. I lost you for exactly after my intervention. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all three and everybody who's been listening. We're at exactly 2.30. And we are now turning over to the second panel and my colleague, Pat Stomach. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. That was a, a really uh, interesting panel. Uh, I think the, the when Bo and I sort of were preparing this, we thought that, uh, you know, for our two hours here in Sweden, it would be interesting to point out, you know, what we're doing different uh, in Sweden. Uh, I think Sweden has gotten a lot of uh, attention for being different, uh, not all in a positive way, um, but I think this uh, 
was a really good start to sort of make, understand a little bit of what, why the policy choices have been made the way they have in Sweden. Now, if I can see if I can now share my screen here. I, uh, before I turn to the panelists here, I just want to have uh, a few um, introductory slides here. Let's see if this works. Oh, now oh, you're kind of seeing this. Okay. Uh, and let me just do this. So um, ECGI um, is about corporate governance. So I thought that it would be interesting to discuss a little bit in a way, another way which Sweden is, is different, which might have some impact on how we deal with this crisis, which is in terms of the Swedish way of running firms and handling stakeholders and firms, the Swedish uh, corporate governance system. So before I uh, go to the panelists, um, just to maybe in a nutshell, try to summarize a little bit of, of the Swedish governance, you know, way of thinking about corporate governance. And it's a little bit of a conundrum because in many ways we look, you know, quite a bit like uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon model, quite a bit like the US or the UK. Uh, we have a large developed stock market. We have a big financial sector. We have a lot of private equity um, firms here. Um, and we are, you know, big exporting uh, open economy. Um, but on the other hand, you know, so on one hand, very market oriented uh, uh, system. On the other hand, we have a very large public sector. We have a big welfare state, as we've been talking about, with healthcare, education, etc. And we also have um, a labor market, which is characterized by collective bargaining and a high degree of unionization. Just to show you some quick pictures, uh, you know, public sector employment, relatively speaking, Sweden at the top. Um, unionization, 67% of uh, uh, total employees are organized in, the, uh, in labor unions. And I think labor unions, you know, the, the go beyond that because even if you're not in the union, you're often subject to, um, to the agreements that are struck. Um, then on the other hand, stock market capitalization to GDP, we're among the highest in Europe. Um, one of the things that, you know, we think about what's different in the corporate governance system in Sweden, uh, which we'll come back to is that the ownership of firms is different. Sorry. Different screen. Oh, I'm not showing the right screen. No, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I'm apparently screwing up my screen here. I'm not as tech savvy as I should be, I guess. Okay. Now you should see something. Is this? No. Oh, here we go. Okay. So um, maybe I should just uh, go back because I have these beautiful pictures. Okay. Stock market capitalization to GDP, highest among the highest in Europe. If you look at how our firms are owned, um, this is from a famous paper by Laporta et al. It's getting a bit old now, but I think the facts are still pretty true. This is the ownership of our public companies. And one thing that's striking is that the widely held corporation that lacks large owners, we, do, we don't really have those in Sweden. Uh, even among the public companies, you know, 55% of them have a 10% or bigger family block holder, um, as well as other uh, institutions having, having big stakes which I think is important when you think about corporate governance and not the least in how we're handling a crisis. The um, other thing that I think many people would find surprising, you know, we're, we're a welfare state, a lot of, uh, I talked a lot of American colleagues that thinks that Sweden is sort of half socialist um, or more than half socialist. But um, as a matter of fact, interestingly, we, you know, if you think about private equity as being the, the uh, most, you know, uh, uh, typical or the most extreme capitalist phenomenon that we can come up with. Sweden has one of the highest private equity markets in the world uh, per capita. I guess we are third behind the US and the UK. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting system. It's a very interesting mix uh, when it comes to corporate governance. So 
the question is, you know, how is that affecting the way firms are dealing with this crisis? So I thought, you know, for this panel, we have um, three really um, exciting panelists who each, I would say, are here to, you know, talk about their experiences, but they also represent three different stakeholders that are central in corporate governance. We have a representative for from owners, um, Pietra Hedengron. Pietra is the chief counsel and head of corporate governance at Investor AB, which is one of the most important owners in Sweden. It's the traditional the holding company that's closely connected to the Wallenberg family in Sweden. Um, so we're going to start out with her. Uh, then we have a representative from you know the managers the, who run the firms, uh, Liv Forhau. She's the CEO of Martin and Servera. She will talk a bit about her uh, company um, in her remarks. And then uh, last but not least, we have um, representative from the employee side. Um, so Martin Linde is the president of Unionen. Unionen is the largest white collar union in the world, uh, I believe. Um, so it organizes uh, white collar workers uh, in Sweden. So um, with that, let me stop sharing and uh, turn over to um, Pietra to start with. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I'm going to try and share my screen. And if I don't succeed, I'll just uh, skip it. <laughs> Does that work? Yes, it's working. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, else there? Okay, sorry. Uh, so as as uh, Per said, I'm uh, Petra Hedengran. I'm general counsel and managing director for Investor AB which is an industrial holding company with net asset value of about 45 uh, billion euro. Um, our holdings uh, have a very large breadth. It, it includes large stakes in a number of global listed companies such as ABB, Atlas Copco, Ericsson, Electrolux, SCB, etc. And we also have a substantial portfolio of wholly owned companies within different industries. Uh, how we work as an owner is, uh, of course, in the wholly owned companies, we're very active uh, and we have board representatives, but also uh, nominate um, experts from the industry and, and, uh, and market. And as a reference shareholder in the listed companies, we appoint uh, representatives to the boards. And I myself happen to be then on the board of Electrolux, which is one of our portfolio companies. Just to start, you know, how are we impacted by this? Uh, I would say it's impossible to give an overview or summary of how COVID-19 has affected us and our companies, but it is very obvious to us that basically every industry where we are act, active has been affected, however, in very different ways. Uh, and just to give you a few examples to show the breadth of implications and effects, I just picked out a few companies. And the first one that, that sort of stands out is the biopharma industry company, Sobi, where we are a large owner. And they last week issued a reversed profit warning due to increased demand as a result of COVID-19 because they have a product that is now tested uh, for treatment uh, of Corona. And of course, if that's successful and if, if they get this rapid FDA permissions, they would probably have a supply problem. Uh, Another example is medical solution company Mönlike, which is one of our wholly owned companies. They have a number of products. Uh, one of them is protective masks. Uh, and a few weeks ago, or 
10 days ago, they got stuck, stuck or confiscated in a European country, I shouldn't mention, due to protectionist measures. Uh, and we as an owner had to do some political inter intervention just to, to finally get that released. But that was also a very odd effect that, uh, that was devastating for the company uh, in the situation. But most of our portfolio companies have a different pattern and, and problems. And of course, it comes down to, first of all, employee safety and health, production disturbance, supply chain problems, lack of components, logistics, both for getting, getting things into the factory and out there. And also, I mean, we see that the online sales are increasing and that is creating additional logistic problems. And of course, demand uh, is decreasing. Uh, and, and some of this is, of course, caused by more rational, uh, you know, prioritization uh, of health. But we also see some problems in uh, caused more by protectionist measures and politicians racing to show decisiveness and action. Uh, Electrolux, as the last example, where I'm, I'm, I myself on the board, have, has had major uh, problems as a lot of our production, really critical production cluster, are in northern Italy. And once we got that uh, sort of, uh, you know, under control, uh, our sub suppliers, which also happens to be located in northern Italy, uh, and they supply things we need for the production all over Europe, uh, they were not as lucky. So then we had, had that problem. And in parallel, all retail chains in Europe, in Central Europe are closing. So demand is, is, is going down and it's getting really tricky. And we've really followed this from China and then Europe. And now we are facing tremendous problems in, in Latin America where, where different things are happening. Uh, just to say some, uh, so a few words about the challenges from an owner perspective and board perspective. Uh, I think one of the things I thought about is that as the market and landscape is now changing so rapidly, as a board member, you can see that the overlap between strategic and operational issues increases significantly. And it's very hard to see where you are acting. And it's also increasingly hard for the board to be on top of things. Uh, it's also, of course, from a board perspective and, and likewise as from an owner perspective, important to find the balance and to make sure that financial discipline and cost cutting doesn't prevent or hinder long-term important investments that need to be made, uh, like in skills amongst employees, R&D, etc. So it, it, finding the right balance there is, is key. Uh, and as an owner, uh, of course, we also uh, need to secure financial capacity to support companies which will run to, into financial difficulties. Uh, and support and, and encourage all necessary long-term investments. And lastly, I just want to uh, point to one issue of concern that we have identified as problematic. And that is the increase of protective measures and populistic initiatives by politicians in the sort of race to show action and decisiveness. And an example of, of the latter is the discussion that is in some European countries that companies that want to be eligible for any type of government support related to corona, such as furlough programs, must refrain 
from paying dividends to their shareholders. I think this, you know, at a quick reflection, it could seem like a reasonable requirement, uh, but I think there is, it could in fact be devastating and create much more harm in the long term than the benefits of the support initiative itself. Dividend payments play such an important part in ensuring a well functioning and efficient capital market where capital is redistributed to where it's needed most. And right now liquidity is more important than ever. And by directly or indirectly restricting companies' dividend payments, the efficient capital reallocation function is hampered and that will increase the problems for those companies that are already facing difficulties. It's also worth noting that dividend payments play a very important part to the pension system, as well as, as to substantial investments in research. And I think it's also important to note that these so-called support programs from the state should be, if rightly designed, an, an efficient way for the government to invest now to prevent a higher cost in the future in the form of unemployment, uh, rather than being regarded as some sign of, kind of financial support to companies. So I think uh, there is a high risk now that political positioning to prevent you know, what would be reckless distributions that we all would agree to will result in some simplified restrictions that actually disables one of the most important functions of the capital market which is now needed more than ever, uh, and thereby long-term becoming more value destructive than, than, um, uh, than uh, beneficial. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll um, stop there. And Great. Maybe a, a short follow-up uh, question before I turn to Lee. So what, uh, what restrictions I mean, the, the, there's been some big government programs, for example, uh, supporting, you know, um, temporary layoffs of, of employees where the government uh, takes part of, of the bill for that uh, and so forth. But um, what kind of restrictions have the government so far put on firms, um, you know? I, I think the most, in, in Sweden, the most, and I know that this has been discussed in, in other European countries, but in Sweden, the most uh, pronounced is uh, exactly uh, for furlough for um, uh, employees, uh, which really I think may drive some companies to uh, to have to terminate employments rather than using the system, which is you know uh, not good for anyone. Right, and it's basically they're saying, well, you cannot pay dividends at all, or there's a cap, or how does it work? It's uh, the, the, it's not, uh, the discussion has been, you cannot pay dividends at all during this year, mm. uh, if you want to make sure you can use the program. And that of course makes companies, even very healthy companies with a strong balance sheet, they feel that is it reckless of us to pay our normal dividend that is expected and, and it's important for the trust in the market and the, the valuation of the company basically. Right. Uh, can we pay that is, or is that reckless in case we should go into further problems as this is prolonged and in the autumn perhaps we, we actually might, be, might need to use the, the, the system. Right. And right now I would say it's unclear where that ends up, but right. it's a debate that, that is worrying, I think. Right, right. Um, so uh, I'm gonna come, we're gonna talk more about these issues later, but now I wanna turn to uh, Lid. Thank uh, you. Who is, uh, well, maybe you can present yourself and, the, and, and your firm, but you're the CEO of uh, Martin and Servera. Right. Uh, thank you, Per. Yeah, so Martin and Servera is uh, Sweden's largest food service wholesaler. So we have a turnover about uh, one and a half billion euros or 15 billion uh, Swedish uh, krona um, and we are uh, we have about uh, almost 50 percent market share so I think our ex what we see with our customers is rather representative for the whole market 
70% uh, of our customers or our turnover is related to uh, restaurants, hotels and catering and another 30% is public sector. Uh, it's a family owned company. It's uh, since a few months back fully owned by the Axel Jonsson family who is a large owner family in Sweden. Uh, so far, uh, since about uh, mid-March, our sales have dropped around 50%. And that number is kept up by the public sector part of our business. So the private uh, parts is down by about 60%. And some of our customer segments like hotel, conference facilities, uh, event facilities, and so forth uh, are down as much as 90% in some cases. So it's very uh, it's a very bad situation, um, and I think some of the media pictures that we see here, and I know it's shown on some international media, where it seems like people in Sweden are just going about life <laughs> as normal, and you know, uh, out and about and in restaurants is uh, clearly, um, as shown by these numbers, not true. Mm. Uh, so people are behaving quite differently from before. Um, I think that in our specific case in, in the company that I'm responsible for, we are fortunate enough to have a strong balance sheet, uh, owners uh, who are long term and also have a strong balance sheet. So I am, this will be a, a very, a, a, it's a crisis for us, but uh, we will uh, survive this crisis and come out on the other side. We feel quite confident about that. But I'm uh, very concerned about our customers then. So uh, the restaurant sector, and it's very similar actually to the retail sector as well. So not grocery retail, but all other parts of retail. And you know, combined, the service sector constitutes 65% uh, of Swedish GDP and 70% of jobs and restaurants and retail is 25% of that. So it's a very important sector in terms of employment um, and keeping the economy going and uh, there are many small companies with thin margins and um, um, not so strong balance sheets that do not have the ability to survive you know a 50 to 90 percent drop in sales for a long period of time uh, so we are seeing bankruptcies among our customers already after you know a month uh, more or less of crisis and this will of course uh, continue um, and the government support packages that we've seen they are helpful to some extent so these furloughs Petra that you mentioned which means that companies can lay off for a percentage of people's time so you can reduce time worked to down to uh, 40 percent so two days a week or a reduced working day and uh, almost a proportional reduction of cost and then the employee will get uh, um, some reduction of salary but not that much uh, somewhere between seven and ten percent so that's helpful to us uh, and it's uh, it feels very geared towards the large corporations uh, in sweden export companies so it's a it's a it's a good package uh, for our kinds of businesses however if you have a small restaurant and you have no sales uh, you know, you still have your rent to pay and you reduce your personnel cost in half, that doesn't really help you that much. Um, so I think that there is more to be done to make sure that this sector remains in place two months from now. Uh, so, uh, and what we see in some other countries like Denmark, for example, the government steps in and relieves these companies fulfilling certain criteria obviously it could be specific sectors that you designate or you could have criteria such as a certain drop in sales or something like that um, you, you basically take over a large part of their fixed cost base including rent and uh, I don't feel like enough has been done there there is a program with if landlord pays uh, you know the government will sponsor with the equivalent amount but you know it's hard um, Sometimes the landlord doesn't want to uh, reduce rent, and then what does the restaurant do? Uh, and also a 50% reduction is maybe not enough. And a temporary, if a program was put in place for maybe two months time, I also feel like hopefully in two months, we will have a lot more certainty around what path this will take. Uh, will we be, you know, will there be a re recovery in the fall? How, uh, how slow will it be? 
but it will give some sense of what the future looks like. So right now for restaurants, it's like staring into complete uncertainty and you still have a lot of cost to carry. You may be taking out a second mortgage on your house, you know, and do you really want to do that if you don't really know if you're going to be alive two months from now? So I don't feel enough has been done there. Um, although some things have been, have been done in a good way, I want to say that. So um, that's, that's a bit um, where we are and some, some reflections from uh, where I sit. And I think I'll stop there, Pat. So um, let me just, before I turn to Martin, um, you mentioned a lot, uh, you know, the uncertainty you're operating in and how long will these programs go on and so yeah. forth. I mean, uh, Pat Cusel brought that up in the previous panel too. Yes. Do you feel that you're lacking transparency from, from the government, that they could be more yes. open? Yes, uh, I do feel that. I, I mean, of course, I have a lot. Well, first of all, I would say that Pär's message in terms of the government stepping in now to, prevent, to enable a fast comeback. You know, a restaurant is not uh, dependent on a very complicated international supply chain. Uh, you know, so that means that when demand comes back, when life returns to normal, they could very quickly pick up that demand and help restart the economy. But they can't do that if they don't no longer exist. Right. You know, so I think it's very important what, what Par said earlier, and I, I fully support that message. Mm -hmm. um, about transparency, of course, I understand that it's extremely difficult because, you know, nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. But I do wish that the um, public health authority would be a bit more explicit in their assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that other countries have been more explicit mm -hmm. about their assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I've spent quite a lot of time actually trying to yeah. understand the curves and, uh, and uh, I have some uh, close relatives who are uh, uh, medical professionals uh, and so forth also. So it's very unclear to me what the, what the, you know, the basis for their assumptions. And I think it would be helpful. I think people understand that it's uncertain, mm. uh, but it would be helpful to have, you know, scenarios uh, mm. presented and, and be more transparent about mm. the assumptions. Mm. And also uh, from a government point of view, mm. Uh, how they see this evolving and sort of a bit of what if, you know, if this happens, then we will do X and so right, forth. Right. But of course, I have a lot of respect for the fact that it's incredibly difficult to understand that. Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. they don't have, don't have any idea either. Maybe they should say, we have no freaking idea. And yeah. then at least you would know that. <laughs> but that's also why I think a lot of these support packages are really important until we get to a stage where maybe the epidemic is not over, but it will be clearer to us, you know, mm. what, what kind of path it will take. And, they, you know, the government needs to help carry businesses over that right. point of, of complete uncertainty. Right, right. Thank you. So I'm going to turn now the word over to Martin. Uh, Martin is the president of, I guess you're the biggest union in Sweden organizing private sector workers, if I understand correctly. Uh, and the biggest white collar union in the world. That I think is great, but yes, please Martin. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event and discussion. Uh, I will give you some comment from my perspective. Uh, and as you heard, my name is Martin Linder and I'm president and chairman of the trade union Union in Sweden. Uh, we are actually the largest trade union in Sweden with today 675,000 members. Uh, and as you heard, we organize white color workers in all of the private sector. So when I say I will give my, from my perspective, my perspective is a Swedish labor market and private sector perspective. Uh, how we can respond to crisis like this COVID-19 crisis, it depends both on the structure and the system you have when you enter the crisis, and also on the ability to act when you are in the crisis. Uh, and to just give you a flavor of the reactions of the employees and the employers in the private sector, uh, I can give you uh, initially some of our own numbers. 
In the month, month of March, almost 20,000 individuals signed up to be a new member of our union. That is almost four times more than a normal month. Uh, in the last two weeks of March, uh, we handled roughly 10,000 negotiations on different companies to sign different kind of collective agreements, mostly on the short time work system that I will talk a little bit more about but also about other negotiation, about redundancies and other things. Uh, and that amount of negotiation that we know is, 10,000 negotiation is what we normally handle in three months or more. And now we handle it in two weeks. Uh, and to date we have signed almost 5,000 collective agreement on companies uh, about introducing the short time work system. Sorry, so in conclusion, a little bit of distortion. I don't know if it's the mic or something. Uh, okay, I try to keep the mic close here. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll have to deal. We'll hear what you say. But yeah. Okay. Uh, I try to. Uh, I do my best. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, you can say that there is a huge pressure on the labor system in Sweden, but so far we manage quite okay. Uh, if you take a look at the Swedish labor market. Uh, we see historically high number when it comes to notice about redundancy these days. Uh, the month of March summed up to more than 40,000 employees that were noticed about redundancy. Uh, that is a higher number than both in the crisis in the 90s and during the financial crisis in 2008. And you, we can also see that so far it's quite different from the financial crisis. Uh, Back in the financial crisis, it was mostly in the industry sector uh, and it was geographically mostly outside the capital of Stockholm metropolitan area. This time so far, the crisis has hit, hit mostly uh, in the Stockholm metropolitan area and also in different sectors. And the sector you already heard, it's mostly so far in hotels, restaurants, travel, staffing, transport and different kinds of trades. When we enter this crisis, uh, I think for us it's important and for, uh, important for people from around the world to understand that we, and all countries have, you have a system in place when you enter a crisis. Uh, and we have a, a system with a high level of union organization, uh, roughly 70% of the employees in Sweden. Uh, are member of a trade union. Uh, in the private sector in total, it's 63%, and it's actually in Sweden higher among, among white collar workers where it is 67% in the private sector. It's also important to see that the employers and the companies is also well organized in national employer organizations. And we also have a very high coverage of collective agreements. 90% of all employees in Sweden are covered by collective agreements. And we also have a uh, well-functioned system with social dialogue between employers and unions on all levels, national, sectorial, company, and local level. And I would just like shortly to mention some of the responses that we have done during the last weeks. Uh, uh, we were in the end of negotiation on new collective agreements on both salaries, salaries and working condition in uh, March. Uh, the current three-year agreement should end it by the end of March, uh, and in total 500 new collective uh, agreement on national sectorial level should have been negotiated on the Swedish labor market, and they should have covered 3 million employees. Uh, but as late as the 20th of March, we agreed on to pause, uh, make a pause of the negotiation and postpone the current agreements until October. Uh, uh, because it was not possible, we agreed on to make this agreement in these uncertain times. Uh, and then a few words about uh, the short time uh, work system that you heard a little about already. Uh, after the financial crisis, it was clear both to trade unions and employers that we needed new systems in Sweden to be able to handle different kind of temporary reduced demands for businesses in industry and other sectors. We need a system so companies could handle drop in demand in other ways than to lay off their employees. We could see that such system existed in other European countries. Uh, so for many years, from the union side and from employee organization side, 
We have been demanding this from the government, but there has been uh, resistance from the government uh, and also from the political opposition. But when the COVID-19 crisis made it clear to the government that they had to act, uh, they changed their mind. Uh, and this has now become one of the most important and financially extensive tools to handle the drop in demand for business and the need to lower the costs. It was on the 60th of March uh, that the government decided about the short-time work system. Uh, and in general, you can say it could be implemented when there is a collective agreement about short time work in place. Uh, so two days later, we from my union and union and other unions have signed national agreements on sectorial level. For my own union, that means that we roughly signed 50 national sectorial agreements uh, in a very short time, just a few days. And the coming weeks, uh, we negotiated agreements on company levels. And up to date, as I said before, we have signed roughly 5,000 agreements just in my union. Uh, and you can see that uh, on uh, late of March, 85% uh, of all employees in the private sector, 1.9 million employees, were covered by sectoral collective agreements on short time work. Uh, and that was 11 days after the government decided about the system. Uh, so we think that that shows that there is strength and flexibility in the Swedish labor system. Um, short term work means that the employer can reduce their employees' working hour and receive financial support from the central government to compensate for a significant part of the costs relating to uh, for retaining and, uh, the employee. Uh, and we could hear her, we heard yesterday from the Minister of Finance, uh, and she said that uh, by yesterday there were 127,000 employees that were now on short time work, and the government had uh, up to yesterday paid uh, 7 billion uh, Swedish crown in compensation. Uh, and I think we are all pretty sure that this figure will increase significantly during the coming weeks and months. Uh, I think I stopped there as the beginning. Oh, um, thank you, Martin. So I don't know if it, you can plug in, maybe try plugging in your, your headset uh, again in the computer. Maybe that reduces distortion a bit. But um, before I, I move on to some general questions, you know, it's one of the, the you know, when you, when you talk to uh, um, colleagues in the US, uh, or, you know, when I talk to uh, economists in the US, they are very, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, criticism against uh, unions. They, they, they leads to labor strife and there's uh, short-sightedness. And it seems just to be a very infected environment between unions and, and, and firms sometimes. Here in Sweden, it seems very different. Uh, and I guess in a crisis like this, you know, you, you basically make collective agreements, you uh, strike deals with firms very quickly and so on. Um, I guess what, what makes it so different? Uh, why, why does it seem to be working much better in Sweden, the, the, the relationship between unions and firms than in some other countries, you think? Uh, I hope you can hear what I say a little bit anyway, uh, but uh, that is not an <laughs> easy question to answer in a short time. But uh, I think one of the main thing is that we have this high level of uh, union organization if you if you organize 70 uh, and as we did before 80 percent of the workforce that makes you i think by nature more pragmatic more kind of responsible approach uh, where you are a uh, part of the system and the swedish labor market is also very much constructed that we do very much in collective agreement that in other countries is made by the politicians in law. So um, this has been for many decades uh, kind of a tradition and so far it has worked uh, good also in this crisis situation. Great, thank you very much. I wanna just uh, uh, throw out um, some, uh, some questions here and I see that there's also questions coming in uh, on the on the uh, chat, but um, I guess one of the the issues in the, in a crisis like this is that you know who should 
share the burden, right? I think I guess all of you three agree that, uh, and every panel seems to agree that that you know the government should do a lot. They should support uh, employees. They should support firms uh, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's been some criticism of some of the government programs that they are basically not giveaways, but there's loans. Uh, for example, you can postpone taxes, but that's structured as a loan. You have to pay interest. Uh, you know, we're not covering 100% of the wage bill. The government is covering some part of the wage bill and the government, the firms themselves have to, to, uh, to cover the rest. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on who should share the burden? I know, you know, they probably can, can come up also when you think about, you know, what should, how much uh, of, let's say, wage cuts should employees take versus how much of a restriction on paying dividends should owners take and so on. Do you have any thoughts of how that balance should be struck? struck? Uh, I don't know who wants to, <laughs> to address that maybe. Uh, I mean, if you start with Martin, for example, do you feel that uh, that you're doing, you're 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 taking your share of the burden? Do you feel that uh, firms and the governments are doing what they should be doing? Is it the right mix of of who's sharing the pain here? I start with you, Martin. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. hear you well now. Yeah, I think I had missed a, a setting in the microphone option there, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, uh, well, it's also kind of a difficult question to answer in an easy way, but uh, uh, I think in general we have to see that uh, all kind of parties uh, has to share uh, the burden in a sensible and pragmatic way. Uh, I think that this is very much kind of a win-win or lose-lose situation where uh, I think that we have, for example, for the last month, uh, very much uh, stepped down from our kind of opinion building uh, activities, uh, debating about issues, try to, uh, we have been very rough on ourselves to say that this is not the time to use this crisis to put forward our strategic position. We should all focus now on do what is needed to be done. Uh, of course, we, from a union perspective, want to save as many jobs as possible. Uh, to, to be able to save as many jobs as possible and create, uh, in the long run, uh, more and better jobs. Uh, one of the best tools for that is to have as many uh, companies as possible to survive in a good way in this crisis. Uh, uh, and to make companies uh, to survive in a good way in the long run, you have to have owners and investors that are able to invest their money in that. So mm -hmm. uh, I have, I think I have a very pragmatic view on it that it is, you have to find the balance. And I think that we all need to be responsible to not try to use this crisis as a situation to take strategic uh, step forward in our own advantages. Yeah. Maybe uh, Pietra, do you, from an owner's perspective, what's your thoughts here on the, what, how much of the pain should you be carrying as owners, and do you feel that? I, I, I mean, I, it's a, it's a tricky question, but I think everybody, as as Martin says, everybody has to take their share, at, and and you need to find the balance there, and of course, it will differ between companies. I think uh, a slightly different angle uh, on this is. Uh, at least from the Swedish perspective, when you think, when you look at what has the state uh, done and, and offered, I think uh, uh, as many as many as more needs to be done. But I think one segment of the business, which is is not really what I represent, but but the small and medium sized businesses need so much more support yeah. because they are. Uh, they are so vulnerable working with you know small margins and there it's very very urgent and also I think there helping them is will reduce you know costs for the state in the long term so it's really helping helping you know uh, the state itself I, I, I think more action and, and resources 
needs to be put to, to smaller and medium-sized companies because um, that's a disaster uh, and so much value destruction uh, when they have to to close down. Yeah, yeah. Liv, any any thoughts on on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. And this is, uh, it's not my company, but it's its our customers that uh, Petra is talking about. And I, I completely agree. And it's a, it's a massive waste should all of those companies go bankrupt because they are companies who are basically sound. Mm. You know, they are, they are just small and have thin margins. And it, initially there was a lot of effort put on credit mm. opportunities. Um, so there was uh, funding for the banks in liquidity. There was a tax credit, but you know this is a credit that that is is just a postponement of payment. It's not a you know gift. And also there were uh, there were credit guarantees that the government would step in. But I think it's you know credit won't help. I mean the the debt you run up trying to maintain your costs uh, with no uh, revenues for several months it's too high to ever pay off if you're a small company with so I don't think that's the right way to go. I understand the reasoning you know there shouldn't be free money and so forth and I think there is concern the reason the government is not doing more I would assume is a combination of a fear that it will be abused uh, and of course, you know, wanting to save uh, money for for later, you know, because nobody knows, and there will be a need for stimulus packages um, after the crisis or coming out of the crisis. But just like Pietra, I, I think that you know the need for stimulus will be much larger if you you know allow uh, entire sectors of the economy to be destroyed now. Of course, so it's, it seems to me to be much cheaper to keep companies afloat now than having to pay you know, unemployment and not getting the speedy recovery that you would have had if you had kept um, those companies intact. And I feel like there's a lot of consensus you know, that uh, restaurants, hotels, service firms, and maybe retail except grocery, so to speak, are very hard hit and, and uh, the current support packages are not sufficient. Uh, at least that's what I read and hear. Uh, but unfortunately, the government has not yet. Um, I hope it, it will still come, but they have not yet decided to do more for that sector. It's been a lot about credit. But, but if I, I sort of should play devil's advocate maybe a little bit to all three of you, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, we know that restaurants and hotels, you know, were probably pretty high up in the bankruptcy statistics even sure. before this crisis. Uh, we probably know that we're going through, you know, big changes in the economy of well, what kind of jobs we're going to need in the future and so on. So maybe some people will have to be laid off at some point. Um, and we also know that, you know, certain sectors, shareholders and owners have made a lot of money from dividends and profits. Shouldn't they well, be willing to now, now the, you know, if you're an equity holder, you're about taking risk. Well, now when the risk goes the wrong way, shouldn't you be losing something, right? So, so uh, um, shouldn't some businesses fail? Shouldn't some jobs be lost or, or not? <laughs> I guess sure. That's... I mean, that it's natural that uh, companies fail, but I don't think now is uh, the right time. You know, the and you can put up a criteria, obviously, to say that it's not a you know everybody gets uh, a lot of money, but you should fulfill certain criteria. Either you belong to a certain sector, or you um, uh, have to show a certain uh, drop in sales or something like that. Mm -hmm. But is is there is a there is a renewal so to speak in the restaurant industry all the time but i i don't see why it would be productive and constructive to accelerate that renewal at this moment you know what what do you gain by that the weakest players by the way are already bankrupt you know so i think we're past that point yeah, yeah, yeah. uh now it's uh it's uh, inherently healthy businesses but with thin margins and it's not like why can't their rich owners put up the money well they you know it's because they don't have rich owners yeah. you know it's self-employed entrepreneurs right. who have a mortgage on their house you know to so right. Right. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know, uh, Martin, uh, how do you feel about this? I guess there, you know, the, the job losses here. Uh, maybe some of these will never come back, but maybe some of these jobs, you know, shouldn't come back or people should get reallocated into sectors where they're needed better. Or how do you think about, <laughs> about this? You know, should we accept uh, uh, some job loss in this crisis and how should we deal with that? Uh, I hope my mic is working now as it seems like my picture has been frozen so I have some technical issues here but uh, at least maybe you can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, it, it is actually a very good question. Um, it's quite of a difficult question and it's a question that we kind of strategically discuss quite a lot these days um, because you have to be frank and honest to say that from a Swedish trade union perspective, it has never been a strategy to keep all jobs. Uh, it has always been the strategy to do whatever you can to, to create new jobs. Uh, uh, and uh, non-profitable, non-companies that are not able to survive in kind of the theoretical model that we uh, think of uh, and we have always acted on is that well, it, maybe it's good for us in the long run that uh, these companies uh, disappear and new one uh, uh, enters. But then, of course, it is a very, very difficult uh, to see if is that the right approach in this extreme uh, situation that it is in many parts of the uh, economy. Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think that is very much up to the judgment you make of how long term this will be. Um, what will the kind of exit strategy be? Uh, it also, I think it's a question about, well, maybe we, we get back to some kind of new normal but uh, and open up societies and business again, but how much will this has affected us as people, as individuals, as consumers. Uh, mm. uh, I think a lot. Mm. So you can think that uh, we will not go back to normal. It will be a new normal. And of course, then a well-functioning economy that creates a lot of good job and wealth and prosperity should, of course, uh, mostly support the companies that are well adapted for the future. But uh, it's, it is... I think for all of us, very hard to judge in this situation we are in right now. So I don't know, by the way, I just wanted something Peter said earlier on, um, on and, and leave uh, underscored on the difference between the small firms and the large firms. I guess, does, does your union also have a lot of uh, uh, members in the, in the SMEs and the smallest firms? And do you also see that you worry more about those in that case? Uh, we have members in mostly all part of the private sector, both in uh, different sectors and different kind of size of companies. Uh, uh, I cannot say that we are make our kind of scale in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, of course, mostly worried about some sectors, uh, some uh, that are specifically hard hit right now. Uh, and uh, how could you <laughs> kind of handle that in a way that both that all the company that should survive do it. Uh, and uh, also that the people that have to change job uh, will get the right uh, uh, possibilities to do that. So, Petra, maybe do you have any thoughts on the on the how to share the burden and, and what, you know, owners should be expected to do to uh, uh, do their, their share. Well, I, uh, I, I think many owners are, are you know, are uh, trying to do, as I said, keep financial resources to, because new money will be needed in a number of companies and, and those, where you as, a, uh, as an owner and provider of risk capital see that in the long term this should work out, then, then you're more than willing to, you know, uh, to put your money in that and, and uh, make sure it goes through the hard time. 
so on that note, I mean, how do you how do you balance the short term and the long term here? Because I guess you have lots of different businesses, lot of crisis management, but at the same time, I guess you, since you're long term owner, you need to have businesses that are okay also in six yeah. months and a year from now or five years from now. Yeah. How do you, how do you strike that balance? No, I, I think that that's the extremely difficult uh, thing now, but of course that, uh, you know, to the extent we get distributions from some companies that are less affected now, then uh, we will put them into into other companies that we think are sound uh, and have a long-term uh, possibility to, to be successful. But, but then, of course, it's important that that goes to, you know, investments in, in uh, research and, and perhaps, you know, new skills uh, for employees and so forth. So they need to be, to be in the forefront of changing into the new environment. And, and that, of course, gets extremely difficult now when the map is, is changing constantly and uh, uh, it's hard to to uh, to divide between what is strategic investments and what are you know short-term uh, urgent measures I mean it, it, it gets a, a blurry picture because you need to um, yeah to see a bit into the future but but of course that's uh, that's part of the analysis and, and what we should be, be good at but are you thinking right now that you you basically don't have enough information to really know how much like are all big you know r d long-term projects kind of put on hold now uh more or less or before because it's too much no i mean we are very eager that they, they cannot be be i mean important necessary long-term investments and product development uh, that has to to be maintained because otherwise that company will have severe problems in five to seven years mm. uh, even if you know you, you can survive the next few months so i think it's that balance is is so important yeah so i i want to let uh, I, there's a lot of questions and we're running out of time but jonathan uh you had a question or a comment are you there jonathan or maybe he's uh he, he, he I'm here. More. Oh, I'm there. Okay. Slow about unmuting. Um, I was really interested in Martin Linder's comments about um, the situation with the Swedish uh, organized labor in the wake of this crisis. Did I may have misunderstood, but I, I I thought that he was saying there was a very large increase in union membership and a large increase in collective action. Um, uh, 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 collective bargaining agreements and something like five, did I hear correctly, 5,000 companies have signed agreements since the crisis began. In any event, it, it's very big. And of course, um, it, this focused me on the fact that Sweden, unlike the U.S., has sector bargaining as to many European countries, whereas in the U.S. we have this firm each firm bargains individually. And I wonder whether that US model is particularly bad uh, in a COVID crisis, both in terms of, of having a cooperative re relationship between unions and, uh, and, and, and uh, firms, and also in terms of, of, of making it difficult for unions to grow when they're really needed in times such as this. So once again, thank you, Mr. Linder. I really enjoyed your presentation. I don't know if any of you have any 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 thoughts on that, uh, or Martin, for example. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, you you, you uh, understood me correctly. We have seen a uh, uh, strong increase of interest of becoming member of uh, unions, not in my union, in unions in generally, uh, in the last month or so in Sweden. Uh, and to understand that, I think you, you need to understand that a lot of things that maybe in other countries is kind of in the public safety net. Uh, in Sweden is things that we have for many decades made in uh, part of the collective agreement system. Uh, 
And also one thing I did not have time to mention is that the Swedish unions has set up since many years ago own income protection insurances that makes that if you are a member of a union, for instance, my own union, uh, you will just as a member, if you get unemployed, will get 80% of all of your salary up to 60,000 crowns uh, a month uh, for up to seven months. Uh, and that is much more higher than you will get from the kind of public uh, uninsurance uh, uh, funds. So we have a lot of in our system where it is as a part of uh, being a member and to be part of uh, the collective agreement system that you will be a part of kind of the safety net that we have built in Sweden. So this, uh, unfortunately, I think we could go on and talk for a long time, but I don't think we're allowed. So uh, I just want to thank uh, Petra, Liv and Martin, and I actually look forward to having another longer discussion about these issues at some point. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. And uh, this is all from Stockholm, I presume. <laughs>